Thank you. It's exciting to be back here at Elmira College. I'd like to thank Nate Williams for inviting me to do this keynote address at the Quarry Farm Symposium on Mark Twain, Invention, Technology, and Science Fiction. I warn Nate that I am neither an academic nor a Mark Twain scholar. But I have long felt connected to Samuel Clemens as well as to Elmira College. Although I have a few anecdotes about my connection to Clemens, this talk will mostly be about my background and my own experience in publishing. I will talk about some of the technological changes that have occurred over the course of my career and how that has affected authors, readers, and science fiction magazine publishing in general. I'll cover some of the changes that fiction itself has undergone and the challenges facing today's fiction market. Today, finally, I'll discuss what it means to be a magazine editor in today's world, especially now that we are under tremendous assault from people attempting to get ChatGPT to write stories for them. I'll talk about what it's like to sift through hundreds of submissions to find a handful of great tales, then work with authors and ultimately keep our readers entertained and asking for more. At the end of my talk, I welcome questions from everyone. My connection to Clemens goes back further than my connection to my alma mater. I'm the oldest of five children. My brother and I were fortunate that our father read books to us long after we could read on our own. He segued from children's stories to an eclectic mix of works by authors like Edgar Rice Burroughs, Raphael Sabatini, Clarence Darrow, and, and of course, Mark Twain. Thus, my first exposure to the works of Mark Twain was hearing my father read Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn at a fairly early age. My dad considered himself an entrepreneur, and he took particular delight in Tom Sawyer's fence painting exploit. He loved that Tom was able to get everyone else to do his work for him and even pay him money to do so. My dad kind of modeled his career on that philosophy. <laughs> A different life lesson that my father taught me from the novel came from the scene where Tom is pining for Becky Thatcher under her window. When Tom was doused in slops, my dad stopped and explained that slops came from the commode. I can remember being shocked. Ever after, when one of us kids was feeling sorry for ourselves, my dad would say, remember Tom Sawyer? <laughs> In addition to my life lesson from Tom Sawyer, I gained some more life lessons from a biography of Clemens that I read in high school. One is completely off the subject of this talk, but I told it to Nate, and he said that this audience could appreciate it. <laughs> he says it would be of interest to Mark Twain scholars. The other is Germain, and I will mention it a little later. As I said before, my dad considered himself an entrepreneur. At some point in the 70s, he found himself in a great deal of debt. We were being sued right and left by creditors, and it looked like we were going to lose our family home. My mother was an Irish immigrant. My father hadn't met her parents until after he and my mother were married. But when he did, his father-in-law gave my dad $1,000 to help start up his real estate business. I remembered something from the Twain biography. I told my dad that when facing bankruptcy, Samuel Clemens had been able to protect his copyrights by claiming that his wife was his greatest creditor and transferring those rights to her. Perhaps my dad could save the house by making the same claim about mom. My father decided to follow in Sam Clemens' footsteps and make the argument in court. One of the lawyers for the creditors was disgusted. He said that my mother listed her occupation as a housewife on their joint tax forms. The judge bristled at the lawyer and said that the Queen of England listed, listed her occupation as a housewife, and she was one of the richest women in the world. A few weeks later, we received several envelopes. In each case, the judge sided with Sam Clemens and my dad and against the creditors. My father transferred the deed to the house to my mother and proceeded to pay off his debts in other ways. <laughs> I like to say that during my first 24 years of life, I followed Sam Clemens around the country, if a bit out of order. I lived in Lime Meadow, Massachusetts from 1967 until I graduated from high school in 1974. Lime Meadow is right on the Connecticut line and very close to Hartford, so of course we had a high school field trip to the Clemens Hartford home. My most important connection, of course, is Elmira. I learned about Elmira College from my school guidance counselor. When the college sent a brochure, my father was excited to see the Mark Twain quote that he never let his schooling interfere with his education emblazoned across the cover. I love going to a college that housed Mark Twain's study 
And I even got to see Hal Holbrook perform Mark Twain tonight at the Clemens Center in 1976. I received my BA in philosophy from Elmira in 1978. I left Elmira and immediately went to St. Louis, Missouri to, study, to continue my studies. I studied philosophy at Washington University in St. Louis from 1978 till 1981. I never made it to Hannibal, but at least I was living near the Mississippi River and on Missouri soil. I picked up a master's in philosophy, but everyone was telling us that there were no jobs in philosophy. I decided that rather than pursue a PhD, I'd switch my vocation with my avocation, go to New York City, and attempt to find work at a science fiction magazine. Little did I know that there were actually more jobs for philosophy professors than staff positions at science <laughs> fiction magazines. But I was determined to try. I'd fallen in love with science fiction at five when my father read Edgar Rice Burroughs' The Princess of Mars to me. I founded a science fiction club in high school and again at Elmira. At 14, I discovered that science fiction magazines existed from the writings of Isaac Asimov. He mentioned them lovingly in his autobiography and in his introductions to a series of anthologies called The Hugo Winners. I found my first copy of the brand new Isaac Asimov science fiction magazine on the shelves of Elmira College's bookstore in the fall of 1977. I would have, that was actually the second or third issue. I would have found the first one, but I was junior abroad, <laughs> so, but I, it's a good thing I didn't know the odds. A lot of pavement pounding luck and probably unfounded faith in myself led to the editorial assistant position at Asimov's in June 1982. It was an entry level job, but it was also a dream come true. At that time, it didn't occur to me that I would someday end up the editor in chief. I was delighted to type and file and work with science fiction authors and other editors. I found that I loved participating in every aspect of production of the magazine. It was also an honor and a thrill to spend one morning each week with Isaac Asimov, an author I'd idolized ever since my father introduced me to iRobot and Isaac's Foundation Trilogy. Over the years, I became very good friends with Isaac. Our friendship led to the second incident that was influenced by Samuel Clemens. Isaac didn't choose the editorial, or didn't choose the stories for the magazine, but he contributed a monthly editorial and he provided pithy answers to the correspondence in the letters column that appeared in each issue. Isaac was always pleasant and fun to work with. He told me that if someone made him cross, he might write them an angry postcard, but then he would tear the postcard up. On one occasion though, he provided me with an editorial in which he had crossly taken issue with someone. I worked up my nerve and suggested that he tone the editorial down. After that, he always read anything he thought might be too testy past me first. I kiddingly told him I was his Olivia Langdon who had done something similar for her husband, <laughs> and he agreed. <laughs> 1982 was actually the beginning of a momentous time in science fiction. William Gibson's short story, Burning Chrome, was published in Omni Magazine in July 1982. This story introduced Bill's term cyberspace, which denoted widespread interconnected digital technology. The movie Blade Runner, based on Philip K. Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, was released in December 1982. Blade Runner isn't about cyberspace, but it showcases a lot of futuristic media technology and lends the elements of noir and punk that came to be associated with a new form of science fiction. Life started catching up with art on January 1st, 1983, the day that is widely accepted as the actual birth date of the real internet. In the next couple of years, the term cyberpunk began to be applied to gritty stories that combined urban decay and societal upheaval with artificial intelligence, interconnected systems, and futuristic technology. I can fully attest, though, that the technology that Bill Gibson, Bruce Sterling, Pat Cadigan, and the other cyberpunk authors described was pure science fiction. It was way ahead of the publishing technology that I encountered in my early days at Asimov's. I'll have more to say on that subject in a couple of minutes. Of course, cyberpunk wasn't the only kind of science fiction being published in the early 80s. Indeed, science fiction was going through one of its periodic seismic upheavals. While the practitioners of cyberpunk fiction were experimenting with a gritty and subversive look at futuristic technology, there was another group of authors publishing work that came to be known as humanistic SF. 
Cyberpunk authors wanted to explore the implications of developing computer technology and advancement in other areas of the hard sciences. They tended to look askance at stories that included aliens, time travel, and in their opinion, too much of an emphasis on the social sciences. Some of the cyberpunk authors perceived the humanist authors as not being serious about fiction that looked at the future. Prominent authors in the humanist camp could be considered Michael Swanwick, Connie Willis, Octavia E. Butler, and Lucius Shepard. At times, the cyberpunk criticism of the humanists could be sharp. However, this schism might have seemed familiar to Mark Twain. There are people who claim that the seeds of rivalry between the cyberpunk and humanist authors could be found in the works of Jules Byrne and H.G. Wells, two authors who were publishing what we call science fiction during Mark Twain's lifetime. In a 1904 interview, Jules Byrne said that while he admired Wells, he felt their methods differed. Byrne said, I have always made a point of, in my romances of basing my so-called inventions upon a groundwork of actual fact and using in their construction methods and materials which are not entirely without the pale of contemporary engineering skills and knowledge. While Byrne said he admired Wells' imagination, he seemed to imply that he had no interest in writing his own tales of time machines and aliens. It always seemed to me that Verne might have had more sympathy for the cyberpunk authors than he would have had for people like Octavia Butler, Connie Willis, and even Mark Twain, who all used time travel and complex interpersonal dynamics in the telling of their tales. Still, as I said before, although the cyberpunk writers claim to be grounded in the current science and technological research of the day, much of the technology that these authors envisioned was pure science fiction in the early and mid-80s. Although publishing might have been somewhat unrecognizable to Samuel Clemens in 1982, it has evolved enormously since then as well. While rereading a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, I was struck by Twain's casual use of the term chromo. I googled the word, so now I know that chromo is a nickname for a color print produced by chromolithography. Obviously, everyone reading Mark Twain in Clemens' era knew what a chromo was, but I'd be hard pressed to explain what chromolithography is to you. The same is true of many of the terms we used back in the 80s. One of the last stages of the magazine came to be known as repro, a term that itself is short for reprographics. The repro was literally cut and pasted onto gigantic boards. Each board contained 16 pages, and these boards were trucked to the printer. We had repro pens that we used for writing on the boards because the ink was invisible to the printing press. We had blue lines that were, we had blue lines which were the negatives of the set issue that were sent back to us for our final approval. We also had physical stacks of slush manuscripts. Hundreds of these manuscripts were delivered to us each month by the United States Post Office. They filled up entire bookcases in our New York City office. While they were electric, I'm sure Mike Twain would have been comfortable with our 1982 typewriters. The editorial staff didn't get correcting typewriters until around 1985. I got my first office computer in 1989 and switched to desktop publishing in 1996. We introduced an Asimov's website in 1998 that allowed customers to subscribe directly to our magazine over the internet. At first, the process wasn't quite as magical or instantaneous as readers might have thought. As the woman behind the curtain, I was the person downloading all these orders. I forwarded them from New York via inter-office mail to our fulfillment department in Connecticut to get, to Connecticut, to get access to the orders I had to plead and convince my company to give me my own email address. Many changes ensued from the desktop publishing process. I knew times had truly changed in the early 2000s when an assistant asked me why I had a blue pen in my pencil cup. I said it was for writing on repro. And then he asked me, what's repro? At this point, I was going to whip out the pen but we closed down our office during COVID, and I don't know what box it's in, but I found the picture on the internet, so this is what they look like. <laughs> and I kept it as a souvenir, but they, nobody uses them anymore. Desktop publishing actually meant that I took over a lot of work that had formerly been done by the type house as well as by the printer. I was constantly mastering new skills, but at least these skills helped ensure a certain amount of job security. I became the editor-in-chief of Asimov's in 2004. 
A lot of my production work continued, but now I was also responsible for choosing all the fiction. I'd always worked on line edits with authors, but now I was responsible for all the rewrite edits as well. Becoming the editor of Asimov's was incredibly rewarding. I've always viewed each issue as a work of art, and now I was solely responsible for curating the magazine. As editor, I've been the first SF editor to discover writers like Ray Naylor, Gregory Norman Bozert, Dominica Fetaplace, Nakomi Chaka, Ted Kosmaka, Jendai Brooks Flemister, and many others. Finding a new writer is a wonderful experience. Publishing their next story is almost better because now I know their first story wasn't a fluke and that they'll be sticking around. Another aspect of my job is that I get to make my opinion known by writing an editorial for almost every issue. In 2009, we began offering digital editions of the magazine on Amazon and from Barnes and & Noble and other places. We're not available for free online, but these digital editions can be downloaded to any e-reader. We were one of the first magazines to go up on Amazon's mag magazine marketplace, and sales immediately began to take off. In a challenging era of dwindling newsstands, supply chain issues, and competition from free online sources, digital subscriptions breathe new life into the magazine. In 2010, we began to take online submissions from writers. A colleague set up a website where writers could submit their stories directly to us. Almost overnight, our mountains of paper slush disappeared. The volume of submissions didn't go down. But we no longer had to hunt for a place to store the mail. Our receptionists no longer had to spend hours opening manuscripts and sealing them up again. Asimov's had always been on the cutting edge of publishing. In 1983 and 84, we published important work by Octavia E. Butler. That's her, the issue that we published Blood Child in. We published William Gibson's second cyberpunk novel, Count Zero, in 1986. That was the first issue, ran over a couple of issues. In 1996 and again in 2000, we published long stories by George R. R. Martin that would eventually become parts of the famous Game of Thrones novels. These are long before, these are a bit before the first novel came out. We've published everyone from James Tipfrey Jr. to Kim Stanley Robinson to Ursula K. Le Guin to Shi Zin Liu. There's no denying, however, that our online submission system made ASMOPs much more accessible for authors. Back in the 80s, it was difficult to get mail to and from Canada. Now an author in Lesotho can get a story to me in seconds. I haven't done a study, but I know that there is far more international representation in the pages of the magazine now than there was when I first started. A Connecticut Yankee looked at the ravages of modern warfare on an agrarian society. Science fiction has often been used as a metaphor for what might happen if today's events spiral out of control. In the 80s, the emphasis was more on the after effects of nuclear war, the AIDS epidemic, and the development of the internet. Stories like Octavia E. Butler's 1984 speech sounds and novels like Connie Willis' Doomsday Book looked at society's devastated by plague and possible biological warfare. In addition to William Gibson, we published almost all the other cyberpunk authors, and our magazine and others were filled with post-nuclear war tales. While times and issues change, some topics will always remain relevant. In 1988, we published a story by Connie Willis called Adieu. In it, a high school English teacher can only find a few lines of Shakespeare to teach to her class because everything else has been banned by one interest group or another. A story that seemed far-fetched in 1988 would fit in perfectly well into 2024 issue of Asimov's. Today's fiction can't escape fears about climate change, repressive governments, religious, racial, and ethnic prejudice, the lives and working conditions of migrants, gender fluidity, and the investigations of transgender lives, the influence for good or ill of AI technology, and many of the other social concerns we see in daily news sources. Authors write about the issues that move them deeply. They don't seem to be worry, as worried about what other writers are creating. SF writers still work, are writing about the future, but there doesn't seem to be as much of an argument about how to envision the future as there was in the past. Wonderful writers like N.K. Jemisin are even comfortable with mixing science fiction with fantasy. In general, I think the science fiction field has become more welcoming to diverse, a diverse body of writers. There's been more outreach to writers 
and readers are hungry for their stories. They don't want a, a diet of stories that just repeat the themes of the past. At Asimov's, I see more stories from North American authors from diverse backgrounds. These include black, Hispanic, Native American, and authors of Asian heritages. I see more work from people whose first language is Spanish or French Canadian. Perhaps because of our ability to take stories over the internet, we see more stories from all over the world. In addition to publishing writers from UK, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand, I'm publishing writers from Ghana, Nigeria, Lesotho, India, Pakistan, China, Russia, Ukraine, the Czech Republic. I'm sure I'm leaving countries off that list. Plague stories have come back with a vengeance. In the May-June 2023 issue of Asimov's, I published Sexy Apocalypse Robot. This deeply moving tale by Sandra McDonald combined a terrifying plague artificial intelligence, and a character's issues with gender identity. Anyone following Hollywood's writers and actors strike will know that the threat of the use of artificial intelligence is a concern to many industries. The actors and writers were partly concerned that their labor would be replaced by AI. At the moment, that's not my concern. My concern is that I will be overwhelmed by AI spam. To give you an idea of what I'm up against, I'm going to quote from my upcoming January, February 2024 editorial. On February 13, 2023, Neil Clark, the editor of Clark's World, and I should add the person who designed my online system, asked if I was being spammed with an increase in AI submissions. By this, he meant submissions from people who had created, created their work by using chat GPT assistance. Neil had a chart that showed just how quickly these submissions were growing. I responded, yes, yes, yes. I didn't have a chart, but I knew that my story submissions had grown from 712 in December 2022 to 899 in January 2023, and they were, they were still on their way up. Neil was working on some projects that would flag suspicious submissions, but it would be a while before these steps could be implemented. On February 20th, Neil tweeted that he was temporarily closing Clarksville to submissions due to the onslaught of chat GBT, generated subs. My submission rate was lower than Clarksville, so I didn't close Asimov's at that time. Yet my final figure for February submissions was 1,088. In an average month, I rarely see more than 700 fiction subs. Now the shortest month of the year had given me a 55% increase in stories and every single AI submission was dreadful. Neil's tweet went viral and attracted attention across the media landscape. Once he explained that this problem was hitting a number of SF publications, a couple of reporters even tracked me down. The magazine of fantasy and science fiction's editor, Cherie Renee Thomas, called on February 21st to ask if she could pass along my contact information to the New York Times. The following day, Neil, Neil recommended me to The Verge. I was in a relatively optimistic mood when I spoke to those reporters. I even made a few lighthearted remarks that, they were, that were quoted in these articles. I wanted to reassure readers, authors, reporters, and the general public that despite the heavy volume of submissions, there was no chance an experienced editor would mistake a chat GP sub for, sub for a tale created by a human being. I told the Times reporter that it's not like young writers need to worry about being supplanted now. It's a worry, but it's got a long way to go. They haven't become our overlords yet. We've taken measures since then to improve our situation. We added language to our guidelines to make it clear that we will not consider any submissions written, developed, or assisted by these tools. Attempting to submit these works may result in being banned from writing, submitting works in the future. By this statement, we mean the use of chat GPT to generate plot, character, setting, and other story development ideas. We don't mean long-standing tools like spell and grammar checks, dictionaries, or thesauruses. Toward the end of April, we closed Asimov's two submissions for a few days as Neil, so Neil could upgrade our system. His upgrade doesn't automatically ban anyone, nor does it catch all the chat GPT generated subs but it does flag a lot of suspicious subs. However, however, this is quite helpful. It does, it, I'm the only person evaluating the submissions to Asimov's. I don't want to waste my time on the AI-assisted direct. I still peruse everything and make the actual determination, 
I have access to a couple of online sites that can detect chat GP generated material. They are helpful for validating my suspicions, but they don't even agree with each other half the time. And so I ultimately, I'll, and they don't always agree with me, but I make the final call. By now I've seen hundreds, possibly thousands of these so-called stories and some nonfiction articles. Although still pretty obvious, the cover letters have improved. In the beginning, most of the letters read like resume cover letters. I'm applying for your job as writer at your magazine. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I gotta find my spot again. Now they tend to claim that the author has been working really hard on his or her story. Despite the common assertion that they are longtime readers of the magazine, it's pretty clear that the authors of these stories have never heard of Asimov's or science fiction magazines in general until they stumbled upon some how to make money online resource. There is absolutely no sign of originality or creativity in chat GPT generated works. There's no sense of narrative, no character development, and the plotting is practically non-existent. There is no indication that the writers of these works ever read a story, heard some folklore, or watched a TV show. I have never read an original human authored submission that was as poorly written or as uninteresting as these pieces. People do worry that ChatGPT material will improve. That's possible. ChatGPTs are a type of large language model, LLMs, that scrape enormous amounts of words from the internet. The more these LLMs absorb the works of published authors, the more access they'll have to sophisticated language and ideas. There's a, but there is a thorny legal problem. No one yet knows if the legal rights to the story generated by the ChatGPT will belong to the person who asked for it or the creators of ChatGPT. It's likely that a contract with the person who submitted the quote unquote story would be meaningless. While wading through ChatGPT generated material has been an unhappy experience for me, there has been one significant silver lining. My admiration for people who take the time to write stories and send them my way has only grown. Every single person who pens their own story has a unique way of looking at a situation. The creative process that goes into title ideas, settings, and every other aspect of human-generated stories continuously tickles me. I will always look forward to reading through the 700 real monthly submissions while I hunt for the six or so that I could purchase for publications in Asimov's. And here's a, there's an image of my latest issue. And, um, Here's a sneak preview of my next cover. Uh, as I mentioned before, editing a professional magazine can be challenging in today's world. Mailing, printing, and paper costs continue to rise. Readers are more inclined to read fiction for free online and less inclined to pay for magazine subscriptions. Most online editors do not receive a full salary if they receive one at all. Some people wonder why there even has to be a gatekeeper. Why not self-publish and let readers discover works on their own? I think my battle with ChatGPT makes it eminently clear why magazine and editors are still fundamental to the creation of a vibrant community of writers and readers. Editors discover new authors. We work with authors to get their work into the best shape possible. We have the experience that allows us to look for the few that we'll showcase in our publication. As I said before, I'm only able to purchase about six stories a month out of the 700 legitimate submissions that I see. That means each issue of Asimov is made up of stories that have faced intense competition to secure their space. The reader doesn't have to wade through the other 694 stories. When a reader purchases an issue of Asimov, they are getting the best of the best. I think Mark Twain would probably approve of our efforts to provide the public with quality and thoughtful entertainment. Thank you. <laughs>